I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Romans 2. I've been inspired by Brother Reuben's teaching in Romans, and, and so one of the things that I've tried to do in those kind of settings is to begin to study in a, in a renewed way or in a directed way myself. The title for the message this morning is Finding a, a Balance. Finding the balance. And Lord, I pray that you would give us ears to hear what you're speaking to us. Lord, let the seed of your word be placed in our hearts. And Lord, our hearts this morning contain good soil. That the seed of your word would grow and become strong in us and take root. And Lord, as we allow it to transform our minds, so Lord, I pray that it would bring honor and glory to you. And that you would accomplish that which you purpose your word to accomplish in our lives. But Lord, also in this community, in this state, in this nation. So we give you praise and thanksgiving this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. It says in Romans 2, 1. Therefore you are inexcusable, O man. Whoever you are, who judge for in whatever you judge another... You condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. You know, one of the things that I've heard is that many times you can tell what a person is dealing with because of that's what they're critical of. That when a person comes out, and you know, I'm not saying that blanketly, that that's always the way it is, but you know, sometimes the loudest opponents of something are the ones that are participating in it the most. And... Um, Paul here is addressing something. This is going to be a little different because I'm going to come back around to this. But I want us as a context, as a foundation for what I believe the Lord wants to say this morning. He says, you're inexcusable, whoever you are, who judge for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge, practice the same things. Jesus said it this way in Luke 6, 37, judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. How many of you know that there's no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus? He says, forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. The same measure. Many times we hear that particular passage talked about in terms of giving, and indeed it applies. But he's talking about as we look at how other people are performing in their life, how their, what their actions are or aren't, what their habits are or are not, whatever we think they should be, that we should, you know, we look at other people and we think you should conform to my sense of morality, you should conform to what I believe is the right thing to do. And he says, judge not, you will not be judged, condemn not, you shall not be condemned, forgive Release, if you will, and you will be forgiven. How many of you know that many times we pray, we say, Lord, judge them because of the hurt that they've done to me, but Lord, have mercy on me. Have you ever prayed that lightning would strike somebody because you were angry at them? Don't raise your hand. I'd be afraid to pray that prayer. I think I would move. Because... The moment I begin to pray against someone else because of the stupid things that they're doing or the harm that they're causing our family or whatever it is, about that time I remember these kind of scriptures and I think, wait a minute. We have a tendency to label people. We label them as homosexual. We label them as alcoholic. We label them as an addict or a homeless person. We label them as a rich person or a poor person, as a Democrat or as a Republican, as an activist. We label them as strange. We label them as weird. In labeling them, we define their actions, which many times are different from ours. Because if they were like us, they wouldn't be like that. 
So they're not like us, so they're different. So we have convenient labels that we place upon people. In defining them then as different, we judge them according to the label that we place upon them. And so we have these generalizations of expectations that we do or do not have by the people and the labels that we place upon them. So if we say that person is a juvenile delinquent, we immediately get this idea of what that means. And generally, it's not good. But what the labels do is it allows us to marginalize them as a people. We marginalize them as people. We see their actions rather than seeing them as a person. How many of you know that every single juvenile delinquent is a son or daughter of somebody? I have yet to actually meet an alien that came from outer space somewhere that doesn't have a human father or human mother. Actually, they need both. They may not know who they are. Let me ask you a question this morning. How, how do we handle people in our families that are labeled? I just want to talk from my heart this morning. How do you handle a person who enters into a same-sex relationship in your family? Thirty years ago, you didn't hear about this. I have a friend who had a daughter that wanted to get married to her lesbian partner. And he called me. He said, he said, Kenton, what do I do? I said, well, what do you think you should do? And he said, well, he said, I've spoken against this. I can't in good conscience affirm this relationship. And he said, I, I really don't feel like I can go to this service. I said, okay. He said, my wife, this is her daughter. And she doesn't affirm the relationship, but she supports our daughter because it's my child. How do you reconcile those two? Because for parents, our children aren't labels. For parents, our children are people. They're flesh of our flesh. They're bone of our bone, if you will. And so I, as I talked with my friend, you know, he's, he's wrestling with this. I said, well, I said, I can understand where you stand. I, I get it. And I can understand where your wife is coming out. I get that too. I said, you need to, whatever you do, you and your wife need to be in agreement. You don't have to do the same thing, but you need to be affirming of each other and supportive of each other in whatever the decision is made. So my friend, he calls up his daughter and he sits down with her and he says, I love you. I want to continue in relationship with you, but you need to know what I believe the Bible says about what you're about to do. And because I believe this is what the Bible says, that this kind of relationship is sinful, he says, I cannot support it. And I will, cannot come to the wedding. Because after all, marriage is an affirmation of a covenant that God established. It's God's idea. And that covenant being between a man and a woman. It's not about us as human beings to somehow change the covenants of God to fit our particular ideas of what culture is affirming. He said, I'll go to the reception. But because in a wedding, there's this understanding that if you're in the building and you're there, you're there as an affirmation. You're there as a support and a blessing of what is happening and going on. And I can't, can't do that. 
But he said, I want you to know I love you. So through the course of their conversation, his daughter said, well, if you're not going to come to the wedding, just don't come at all. And so he didn't. His wife, she went to the wedding. She went to the reception. There were three other, there are three other kids in that family. The oldest son chose to not go with his father, or to, to stand with his father. The other two children went to the wedding. And I talked to him recently, and, he, and I just asked him, this has been a little while ago, I said, how has that worked out? And he said, well, he said, we had another wedding, this time a more conventional one, and he said, some of us weren't invited. But he said, I'm trying really hard to stay humble. I'm trying really hard to walk with integrity. And I'm not letting that situation color my love for them. Because see, the tendency is, well, if you don't, aren't going to, you know, we, we tend to get angry. We tend to let this thing spiral downward to where it's just a bunch of shouting at one another. I believe the key in these kind of situations is maintaining a relationship to the point that when things fall apart, there's a safe place for that son or that daughter to come to to sort these things out and come back to the Lord. Does that make sense? If we destroy the relationship, no matter how much we may love our children, no matter how much we may love that niece or nephew or whomever it is, if we're not a safe individual, if we don't represent the love of God well, they're not going to come to us when it's time to pick up the pieces. All they're going to see from us is criticism, judgment, hate, etc., etc. Are you a safe person for your children to come to? Do your children know what they're going to, what to expect when they come to you with an issue or a problem? Are they going to find a safe person? Are they going to find love? Are they going to find a person that accepts them as a person, not to accept their actions? Or are they going to find criticism, judgment, condemnation? You know, it's interesting. Jesus, he ate with the tax collectors and the sinners. In Luke 5, 30 and 32, it says, And the scribes and Pharisees complained against the disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them and said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Notice that Jesus ate with them. He sat down at the table and he ate with them. He fellowshiped with them. It does not say he preached to them. It does not say he condemned them. It does not say he judged them. He didn't reject them because of their behavior. There wasn't something so vile or gross that the love of, that he had for people couldn't overcome. But he established a relationship with these people by eating with them, by living with them, walking with them. To the point that he took criticism from the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious people, he took criticism because he found himself with the tax collectors, with the sinners, with the prostitutes, with the drug addicts, with whatever it is that they define. He found himself there and not with them. But this relationship provided a safe place for them to hear Jesus' message, and some of them hopefully repent. It says in Luke 15, 1, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. In other words, the relationship that he had established opened up the hearing for his message. It wasn't the other way around. Many times we want to deliver a message without having a relationship. But particularly in your families, particularly when there's people that you love, that they love you, 
the relationship is what is more important than your message because your relationship is what will provide a foundation for the hearing of your message. If they know that you're safe, if they know that you're going to love them unconditionally, no matter what, you're my son, you're my daughter. Then when they come to you with situations or circumstances things they're struggling with, things they're into, things they're involved with, they know that they're not going to be rejected because you love them. Proverbs 10, 12 says that love covers all sins. I've heard it differently. Love covers a multitude of sins. Covers doesn't excuse it. It's just says, I'm going to let love cover this over. Now keep that in mind because sin is still sin. And God judges sin. And I'm going to go through some scriptures here and I want you to bear with me. It says in Romans 1, starting in verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. See, the righteousness of God is revealed in his salvation. His salvation of wholeness, of healing, of, of deliverance. It's all wrapped up in what he did through Jesus on the cross. But just as his righteousness is revealed in himself, the wrath of God is revealed, or the anger of God is revealed against sinfulness. And it's revealed against the ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men. Notice it's not revealed in the men, but it's revealed in their, the way that they have treated God, if you will. Because what may be known is suppressed. And he says, basically, none of us are without excuse because what can be known of God is known, if nothing else, through creation, through seeing what God is able to do, the working of his power, the functioning of God in our world, in our earth. And the unrighteous, he says, are without excuse. He even goes on to say that they instinctively, they know God, but they do not glorify God. I find it interesting for people who say they deny the existence of God, how often they reference him. Because if they really denied the existence of God, he wouldn't even enter into their thinking or into their conversation. But you don't have to be on a construction site very long before eventually it all comes back to religion, if you will. It comes back to life. It says they did not glorify God. They were not thankful to him. And in doing so, they became futile in their thoughts. A consequence of denying God, of ignoring God, of claiming he doesn't exist, is that their thoughts, a person's thoughts become futile. And their hearts are darkened. It's as if God says, you know what, if you don't want to believe in me, that's your choice. But understand that there's going to be a darkness that's going to settle on your soul. He goes on, professing to be wise, they became fools. And change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. And birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up to the uncleanness in the lusts of their heart. To dishonor their bodies amongst themselves. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. And worshipped and served the creature. Rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So having an appearance of wisdom. Instead, they really became fools in denying God. And in doing so, they exchanged the glory of the Almighty God, the incorruptible God, for an image, an idol. Some cultures, it becomes a bird, it becomes an animal. 
You know, our culture, our idols are different. We don't, you know, I, I've seen Buddhas in front of people's houses. Uh, I'm not sure what that is inviting into that house. But it's not of God. But our idols are sports. Our idols are celebrity. Our idols are entertainment. Our idols are self-gratification. Our idols are materialism. What, where are we spending our money? Where are we focusing our time? Is it in the kingdom of God or is it with other stuff? And he says, therefore, God gave them over to uncleanness, given them the lust of their hearts and the corresponding actions to go along with that lust. He says they dishonor their bodies in pursuit of their idols amongst themselves, because many times idols ask to require of us to do things that God does not approve of. In fact, some things that God would call an abomination. But at the core, at the core, they've exchanged the truth of God for a lie. The lie is that they can become their own God, that somehow they can live life and exist without acknowledging that there is a God and that he has the authority that he has. It says they worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. In essence, they've become their own God. And Paul goes on to say, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use of what is against, na against nature. Likewise, the men, leaving the natural use of woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Because they exchanged the truth of God for this lie, that they can become their own God, that somehow they can determine their own future. You know, that's one of the cultural things. This is my God. I'm going to determine what's my God. I'm going to decide what's right for me. And they reject the absolute authority of God. For their own authority. Foolish. Because they've exchanged the truth of God for the lie, God has given them over to what they want. Homosexuality becomes okay because we decided it was okay. Heterosexuality outside of marriage becomes okay because that's what we wanted to do. They commit things that are shameful. In the name of self-gratification, and in doing so, the Bible says they receive in themselves the penalty, the consequences, if you will, of their actions. And we see it spiral downward. As they did not retain the knowledge of God, God gave them over to a debased mind. He's simply allowing the natural progression of what the enemy wants to do in a life and in a culture to happen to do those things not fitting of the righteous. And he says they're filled with all forms of unrighteousness. And I find it interesting because we tend to think about these kinds of things in big picture ways. We tend to think of sexual immorality and, and, and those kinds of issues. But, you know, it kind of gets a little bit close to home. Whisperers. How many of us have went and told somebody else well, how things were wrong? rather than going to the person that we had issue with. Undercurrents, behind the scenes. Disobedient to parents. 
undiscerning, unwor- untrustworthy. Are you, do you keep your word? There's a proverb, I believe, it says that uh, blessed is the man who keeps his word even when it hurts. Have you ever made a promise to somebody only because of the circumstances that change in your life, make it very hard to keep that promise that you made? Do you continue to walk in your word? Unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. How many times do we look at people and instead of having mercy, instead of having compassion, instead of having love for that person, we may not like their actions, but instead of being loving towards them, we become judgmental, critical, and condemning. Who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice these things They not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. And then Paul comes to the scripture that we started with, which is an an interesting turn. Because it's not simply a blanket condemnation of this action and this action and this action and this action. And get your life together and do right and just do it the right way and you'll be okay. Because how many of you know it's not about our performance that brings us into the good grace of God. It's the blood of Jesus that brings us into the grace of God. We are justified, Paul is very clear, by our faith, not by our performance. Our performance may indicate the level of our faith. But God says, no, you're justified by your faith, but don't judge others if you yourself are doing the same things that you're criticizing. An interesting turn. So how do we find the balance between standing on the truth of God and living out the love of God? How do we speak the truth, but speak it out of love? To quote Ephesians, out of love and respect for the person. How do we speak the truth in love and not out of anger? Many times we want to speak the truth and we want to speak the truth because we want that person to know how angry we really are, how angry what they have done has made us. And we want to make sure that they know that. You know who that's about? That's about you. That has nothing to do with them. It's about you exhibiting your frustration at someone else to get it out of your system. The Bible says a kind word is what draws people close. An angry word turns people away. And you want to draw close, you're not going to do it with anger. You just make people defensive. You ever had somebody angry at you? Did that make them want you to go up and give them a hug? Probably not. Not because of embarrassment, particularly with us in the church. Many times we have people in our families, people that we know, they do things that we do not approve of. And because we feel like what they are doing is going to reflect badly on me, we want them to modify their behavior to conform to my sense of what they should do. It becomes about you and not about them. It's not about relationship anymore. It's simply about being Because what you're doing, I believe, is going to reflect badly on me. Therefore, you stop it so that I can maintain what I think needs to happen in my life. And it's no longer in the context of relationship. See, our goal is not really to modify their behavior. How many of you know the Holy Spirit is big enough to modify people's behavior when they submit to him? It's not about modifying behavior. It's about saving their soul. It's about bringing Jesus into their situation and letting him transform their life. Each of us has to find our own way in this. One size doesn't fit everyone. And what you may do with your situation and your family is maybe different from what I do in my situation in my family. How I handle this particular person may be different than the way that you would handle this particular person. My question is, can we continue to love one another in spite of handling things differently? Let's not make this about us. 
You don't have to get your point across. They probably already know. You don't have to make sure that they know how you feel. How you feel is irrelevant to that other person. But take time to have a relationship with the person you're relating to. Take time to eat with them, to drink with them, like Jesus did with the tax collectors and the sinners. To get to know them as a person, to hear their story. And when you begin to hear their story, you may have a little more compassion than you do judgment. It's not saying and excusing sin in any way. It's just simply saying, are you willing to look at them and value them as a person? Let me tell you the rest of the story. With my friend whose daughter entered into a lesbian relationship. About four years previous, she got married to a guy. Within, I believe it was 20 days, this young man had had three affairs on this girl with different women. 20 days of their wedding. And it devastated her. To go along with that, there were issues in her family with one particular man that she really felt betrayed and hurt by. And so she basically, perhaps wrongly, said, you know what, I don't need men any longer. I'm going to find love. I'm going to find acceptance now in the arms of a woman as opposed to the arms of a man. And that's what caused her to go that direction. Is that the right decision? No. Does it excuse or in somehow make okay what she is doing? No. But I have a little more understanding. And so we have to find our way with this and we have to do so with sensitivity and you have to do so by being spirit led, by being led of the Holy Spirit in what he would have you to do. Because sometimes there is a time to speak the truth and to stand firm on it. But sometimes there's a time to speak the truth, but do so in a way that affirms the person and affirms your support of that person. Because you see, a person's actions, a person's label does not have to define who that person is. I want to read one more scripture. In Romans 1, Paul starts this whole thing out. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. For everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ that extends forgiveness, that extends Love that extends salvation to whomever will call on the name of the Lord, whether that person is labeled or not. It's the power of God, Paul says, for salvation. For everyone who believes in Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. I believe that means that God's righteousness is revealed in the fact that even in our unrighteousness, God chose to love us. That his righteousness is what remains constant. His righteousness is what stands firm. His righteousness is what covers the multitude of our sins. And he says, those that are justified by this gospel will live by faith in it. This righteousness overcomes, it covers our human sinfulness. I would encourage us this morning that when you look at someone else and are tempted to judge their behavior, that you realize that God has forgiven yours. 
and that he will forgive theirs too if they will ask. It brings us to a place of levelness. I cannot say that anyone else is better or worse than I am. All I can do is know that God had mercy on me and he will have mercy on you and he will have mercy on others. Let's stand together. This morning, you may need to pray and you may need to say, Lord, help me find a balance in this. Father, I pray that you would minister your life to us here. Your guidance. And Father, as we worship you, as we worship you, Lord, that we would live as you lived, that we would love as you love, Lord, that we would speak the truth and that we would stand on your word. But Lord, that we would do so in a way that not only communicates your message, but communicates your love. And Jesus, we need you. Our culture, our nation, Lord, needs you. Our families, Lord, need you. Our sons and our daughters need you. They don't need me. They need you, Lord. But bring us understanding. Give us hearts, Lord, of love and compassion. Lord, may your word be on our lips. But may your love be in our hands, Lord. In who we are. And Father, we thank you for your mercy, your love that has rested, does rest upon us. As we respond this morning to God's word, there may be repentance that's needed. Repentance basically means you stop doing what is either offensive or disobedient to God and you start doing it differently. It's not like praying a prayer, it's making a decision. And you may be overcome with intercession because you know that your son, you know that your daughter is not living in a manner that God honors. But because you love them. And maybe you feel like I've made mistakes and you simply need to forgive yourself. We've all made mistakes. My Lord, give us the compassion. Give us the strength to love as you love us. So Lord, let us love others. Let's respond to the Lord this morning. I cannot know exactly what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. But just simply lift that up to the Lord. You may need to come forward this morning. You may can do it right there in your seat. But as we worship, I believe that the Lord comes and he ministers. He sits in our midst. So allow him to minister his presence to you this morning. Let's worship together.